So thank you so much for joining me. We've had a tremendous and overwhelming response from participants. We do have 50 questions. They're really wonderful questions that have come in. And as a thank you, I would like to answer them all. Now, you might not be able to join me that long, and that's okay. Uh, if everything goes well, this will be recorded and uh, we will upload it to the Donovan Medical YouTube channel. If everything does not go according to plan, it will not be uploaded to the Donovan Medical YouTube channel. But all the icons that are firing right now and all the messages that I'm receiving indicate that it is being recorded. So, without any further ado, let me start with question number one. But before I do that, I would like to say that scarring alopecia is complex. And many questions that come in are coming in with minimal information. And really, every question does require sometimes a good amount of information that should accompany it. And it doesn't always. And so do keep in mind that any of the information you hear today should be reviewed with your practitioner. And this webinar should be uh, deemed educational. So we'll divide this webinar into four parts, and I've divided it into four quarters, four movements of a symphony, just for the sake of logic. And so there's roughly four equal parts. And if you can stay for one part, two part, three part, four part, that's great. I will stay for all four parts. Question number one. I have frontal fibrosing alopecia. Diagnosed in June 2022, but likely had it much longer than that. I was treated with dutasteride 0.5 milligrams for nine months. I experienced severe fatigue and weight gain of eight pounds within the first three months. My redness did not improve. Dutasteride was discontinued in May as my doctor did not think it was helping, and I was very fatigued. I was also on Accutane, isotretinoin, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This medication resolved my facial papules completely, and many patients with FFA have facial bumps or facial papules. My blood work at my annual physical exam showed very low white blood cell counts of 2.1, and they've come up to 2.4 with stopping of Accutane, I'm scheduled to see a hematologist in November. I have a family history of low white blood cell counts. Now I'm only using topicals for my frontal fibrosing alopecia treatment. Tacrolimus, tofacitinib, clobetazole, minoxidil. Question. Is it possible to get benefits of reduced shedding as well as reduced side effects if dutasteride is reintroduced twice a week? Mondays and Fridays. So thanks very much for this question. The answer is yes. That dutasteride taken twice a week is still effective. It may not be as effective as taken daily. But I really view scarring alopecia management as a contribution from all treatments. And so, does clobetazole once a week do something? Sure. Does clobetazole five times a week do something more? Sometimes it does. But even minimal treatments often do something. And that's important to keep in mind as we think about safety of medications. Often, once weekly, twice weekly, three times weekly treatments really do something. There was a nice study in 2020, if you're interested. And that was a study which looked at if five times a week dutasteride, six times a week dutasteride, seven times a week dutasteride was better for FFA than once or twice a week. And so they looked at all these different scenarios, once a week, twice a week, three times a week. What was the most effective? Five, six, and seven. Those were more effective, but that does not mean that 
two and three times a week are ineffective. And very often I add dutasteride twice a week to a plan, once a week to a plan, if I'm looking for a bit more help. And so um, that is something to talk with your doctors about. And dutasteride once or twice a week is much, much better tolerated than six, seven, and eight times a week. It is a little bit less effective, but uh, that's important to be aware of, that we can reduce side effects by limiting the dose. And so one of the principles we'll talk about today is, as we think about scarring alopecia, I really think of it as almost like a boulder or a stone on a hill. And that stone wants to roll backwards, just like scarring alopecia wants to get worse and worse and worse. And sometimes we can stop that boulder, stop that stone with three people holding up that stone. Sometimes we can hold it with one person. So some people scarring alopecia goes to sleep with Clobetazole twice a week. Some people's scarring alopecia only stops with Clobetazole twice a day, tacrolimus three times a week, cetirizine, hydroxychloroquine, doxycycline, low-dose naltrexone, etc. And so everyone's scarring alopecia is different. And I really view these various treatments as like people holding up a stone. That if this person in this picture is getting tired holding up that stone and is not able to completely hold up that stone anymore, well, maybe we don't need eight people to come in. Maybe we need one person to come in. And so sometimes when a person's scarring alopecia is pretty quiet, but not super quiet, but it's, it's almost there. Patients will ask me, or referring physicians will ask me, should we start cyclosporin or this potent immunosuppressant? Should we start a JAK inhibitor tablet? Well, for this patient, I just need a little bit of help. I need one person to come in and help hold up the stone. I don't need eight. So maybe we'll start steroid injections, or maybe we'll start cetirizine, or maybe we'll start low-level laser. And so this is how I view scarring alopecia, that each medication or treatment has a role, and we don't always need to max out that treatment, and small doses sometimes have a little bit of a benefit. Now, we do need to keep in mind that larger doses and more frequent use Sometimes works better, absolutely. But it's a balance between safety and effectiveness. And of course, what we're trying to do in scarring alopecia is not just hold up the stone, but we're trying to stop it and get it to go to sleep and then push that boulder over the, over the cliff and have it go to sleep once and for all. Because often if scarring alopecia stays asleep for long enough, it just becomes burnt out. And so these are principles we'll talk about today. But thank you so much for that question. Twice a week absolutely can be effective. I've had two scalp biopsies. One in 2018 that indicated androgenetic alopecia, AGA, and telogen effluvium, and another in 2022 that indicated non-scarring inflammatory alopecia that may indicate LPP. I am on oral finasteride, and I've been on Plaquenil since 2018 for rheumatoid arthritis. I failed topical minoxidil. I can't take oral minoxidil because of a heart condition. Spironolactone caused a massive shed, and I'm only starting to recover from with finasteride. I've tried topical steroids with no results. Is it possible that two scalp biopsies would miss a possible diagnosis of FFA? 
My hairline was growing back when I introduced finasteride almost a year ago, but now I'm shedding again and my hairline is receding faster than before. My biopsies were taken from the right and left side of my head near the back. I'm concerned as I cannot get a dermatologist until February 2024. So thanks for this question. Can a biopsy miss FFA? Well, if a biopsy was taken any area on the scalp except in this orange area shown in this image, then it could miss FFA, absolutely. Frontal fibrosing alopecia is a condition that affects the frontal scalp, sometimes behind the ears, sometimes behind the scalp. It, of course, affects the eyebrows, eyelashes, body hair. But if a patient has had a biopsy halfway back, not anywhere near this orange zone, then it is not a biopsy to rule out frontal fibrosing alopecia. And so many patients come to me with five biopsies. And the first thing I need to know is where were these taken from? And if they're not taken from an area where the condition lives, then essentially we just have to ignore those biopsies. So if a patient has had a biopsy somewhere in this orange area, then, and it doesn't show scarring alopecia, then it's pretty reliable that it's not scarring alopecia. Not impossible, but pretty unlikely after two biopsies. So that's uh, important to be aware of. Now in this question, a patient was doing really well and now is starting to shed again. So why would a person start to shed again? Well, there's many reasons. Stress can cause a person to shed again. A person with low iron or a thyroid problem or started some other medication can shed again. If a person was doing really, really well on their treatment and then went on a diet, they can shed again. If they had COVID, they can shed again. If they had the flu, they can shed again. And of course, if the scarring alopecia acts up again, which it sometimes can, then they can shed again. Sometimes medications, if they're compounded, sometimes medications, if they're ordered from the internet, can be incorrectly dosed. We always have to keep that in mind. We hope that never occurs, but it's on the list. And of course, if someone was using a treatment and then went on a one-month holiday and forgot their medications back in their home country. And then when they came back from their wonderful vacation, they just kept it in the medicine cabinet. They can shed again because that medication was doing something so useful and now it's not used. And so there's a whole number of reasons why someone who is so stable can shed again. And we're in an era right now, since 2020, where many people are going through abnormal shedding from COVID-19, and oftentimes asymptomatic. And so that's hard to prove, but we have to keep it in mind. So I often will ask, do you remember having a runny nose? Do you remember anybody in your family sick? It doesn't mean it was the cause, but it's something that we have to keep on our radar. But these are some of the reasons why someone can be doing so well and then shed again. So do review all those factors with your physician. Question three. In May, I was diagnosed with LPP, which was confirmed by a biopsy in June. In late July, I went for a second opinion with a highly experienced hair specialist. Based on clinical exam and review of my original biopsy, he feels that my hair loss is primarily due to androgenetic alopecia, accelerated by previous treatment for breast cancer, as well as the use of an aromatase inhibitor, in addition to dandruff and possible telogen effluvium. Although some minimal scarring was noted, the doctor... Um, the doctor did not seem concerned about this since I do not currently have scalp inflammation beyond occasional itchiness. I was advised to stop my tacrolimus, use clobetazole only as needed, and continue with oral minoxidil 1.25 and ketoconazole. I also use the iRestore laser. 
Finasteride dutasteride was not recommended because of my history of breast cancer. And I was told to avoid supplements or shampoos with saw palmetto. I previously tried spironolactone but stopped because of dizziness. I continue to have a large amount of shedding and diffuse thinning, which is scary, but hopefully temporary due to minoxidil. Here's my question. Is subtle perifollicular fibrosis in a biopsy likely to indicate early stage LPP or probably related to the AGA and previous scratching due to inflammation and itchiness several months ago? Should I ask more questions of the doctor regarding the biopsy? Or just follow the recommendation to stop the topicals and wait and see what happens? Well, the short answer is I would need to see the scalp to know one way or the other what is going on. But there are some really important principles here. And that is that when you look at biopsies of lichen plano pilaris and androgenetic hair loss, you'll note some very important things. First, both biopsies show perifollicular fibrosis. Both androgenetic hair loss and lichen plano pilaris show perifollicular inflammation. So often what happens is a doctor does a biopsy and says, I think it could be LPP. Sends it off to a pathologist and the pathologist says, I see perifollicular fibrosis and I see perifollicular inflammation. If you're thinking LPP, it could be LPP. The problem is, is that androgenetic alopecia also has perifollicular inflammation. A high percentage of biopsies, even up to 80%. And perifollicular fibrosis is often present as well. So those aren't useful features. So how do we differentiate them? Well, LPP has loss of sebaceous glands in the biopsy. Androgenetic hair loss does not have loss of sebaceous glands. Lichen plano pilaris shows death of hair cells. We call that lichenoid inflammation or necrosis. Androgenetic hair loss doesn't have those features to any significant extent. And when you do special stains, you see that the delicate elastin network or tissue network is destroyed in LPP to some degree, and it's not in androgenetic hair loss. And so when I hear a biopsy come back that says there's perifollicular fibrosis and perifollicular inflammation, my immediate response is, yeah, what about sebaceous glands? What about the lichenoid inflammation and necrosis. Tell me, tell me. And too often we stop at step one and two. And so when I hear your story that um, you were diagnosed with LPP, which was confirmed by a biopsy, that intrigues me, but it by no means says to me, okay, this patient has LPP. Biopsies don't prove LPP. We diagnose hair loss by listening to the entire story, examining the scalp, and sometimes that's where we stop. And if we need to do a biopsy, we do a biopsy. But we put the biopsy back in the pot with the clinical information and the examination findings, and the three of them sit there in the pot, and we look at all three of them together. The biopsy is not the final stage. And so when the visit occurred with the experienced hair specialist, the experienced hair specialist likely was able to look at the scalp and say, this isn't like a plano pilaris, and perhaps look at the biopsy and see that the features weren't present as well. And so this is a very common scenario. Lots of people are diagnosed with LPP and they don't have LPP. And so it's important to keep in mind that there's more to a biopsy of LPP than just perifollicular fibrosis. So subtle perifollicular fibrosis, could be androgenetic hair loss, could be lichen plano pilaris, doesn't really mean anything. So when I work with doctors, I tell them when you see perifollicular fibrosis, just to cross it out. It doesn't help you much. Could be androgenetic, could be LPP. Just pretend it doesn't even exist. 
Look for more clues in the biopsy, like loss of sebaceous glands, lichenoid inflammation. Those are the clues that tell you the diagnosis. Are there any studies on the use of either finasteride, dutasteride, or saw palmetto with breast cancer survivors? That answer is no. There are no studies of finasteride or dutasteride in breast cancer survivors with hair loss. My feeling is that it's a complicated issue. And we do not have any great evidence in the year 2023 that finasteride and dutasteride increase the risk of breast cancer in women. We don't have any great evidence that they don't, and we don't have any great evidence that they do. In the 20 years or 25 years that finasteride has been used to treat androgenetic hair loss in women off-label, because, of course, it's not FDA-approved. There hasn't really been a particular signal or worry that suggests that we should be thinking closer about this. Finasteride has been studied in males with breast cancer, and maybe eight or nine studies have suggested that Finasteride does not cause breast cancer in males. But one study suggested that finasteride could cause breast cancer in males. 99% of breast cancers occur in women and 1% occur in males. So there have been studies in males. And it was that one study of finasteride causing an increased risk of breast cancer in males which set off this field thinking that, do we need to be worried about this in some way? Subsequently, there have been many very good, reasonably large, well-controlled studies suggesting that finasteride doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer in males. And so we're left with that one study that we must reflect upon. And we can either look at that study and say it was a poorly done study and let's ignore it, or we can look at that study and say it's relevant, let's keep it in the back of our mind. But we don't have any studies in, in women, zero, that suggest that there's an increased risk of breast cancer, any, any well-done studies. So the answer is we don't know for sure that it does, and we do not know for sure that it does not. Other antiandrogens, especially spironolactone, have been studied in three good studies. And those studies have suggested that spironolactone, another antiandrogen, does not increase the risk of breast cancer in women. And so for those of you who feel that finasteride is a cousin of the antiandrogen family, we've got spironolactone, We've got finasteride, dutasteride, bicalutamide. That one of them seems reasonably safe. Maybe the other should be too. Then you would be of the mindset that finasteride, dutasteride should be okay. And so after 25 years of using finasteride and dutasteride off-label, we, we don't really have a signal that suggests we should be worried. But um, that is why we have those concerns, and they still exist, uh, pertaining to those studies in males. And so in women with uh, a history of breast cancer, I am um, reluctant to use uh, finasteride and dutasteride. doesn't mean it's impossible. And there, there are some studies now emerging with the use of finasteride and dutasteride in patients with breast cancer, in fact, some this year, 2023. And so I think time will tell, but we really need those good studies done, and we really need people in our field to look closer at that question, because right now there is no particular reason to believe, except it has been passed down by generation upon generation of clinicians teaching other clinicians 
about the use of finasteride and dutasteride in women with breast cancer. So it's a tough question. I don't particularly use it. Salt palmetto is a herb, an antiandrogen herb. It is a natural product available without a prescription. But that doesn't necessarily mean it is safe. Salt palmetto is what we call an endocrine disruptor, so it does have effects on the endocrine system. And I think that if we were to have concerns about finasteride or dutasteride, which should be left up to each clinician, then you equally should have concerns with salt palmetto because it's it's an endocrine disruptor. We know that it affects some of these endocrine and hormonal systems in the body to a significant level. And if a concern was to be reached with finasteride dutasteride, then salt palmetto would be in that category. So it's a tough question. We, we don't really know for sure. The standard of care in North America has tended to be not to use finasteride and dutasteride in women with breast cancer. That may be changing slightly in, uh, in recent years, but uh, spironolactone is one of the antiandrogens which is increasingly used. And so thanks so much for this question. There's uh, sometimes no perfectly right answer. Uh, it comes down to a clinician's assessment of the situation and, and the patient's situation as well. Other treatments that have been tried, if there's all treatments have been tried and the only thing left on the list is finasteride or dutasteride. What is the patient's history of their cancer? What has been the view of the oncologist? So there's a lot more that sometimes goes into these stories before a treatment is tried. Would a topical version be safer? Yes, it certainly would be safer. That, in many aspects, is easy to answer. A topical would be safer. Would a topical be completely safe? No. But would a topical be safer? Yes. Topical finasteride still gets absorbed into the body, depending on the topical finasteride that is compounded. And do keep in mind that there are 65,000 topical finasteride formulations. Jimmy's Pharmacy down the street and Sally's Pharmacy up the street and Vanessa's Pharmacy on West 4th and Mr. So-and-so's on West 5th, they all make different topical finasteride. And there's tens of thousands of topical finasterides. Some get absorbed really easily. Some don't get absorbed very well at all. And so topical finasteride is certainly safer but there's probably some topical finasterides that are even safer than other topical finasterides. And so the topical finasteride world in and of itself is challenging. Question five. I have been diagnosed with FFA four months ago and have been taking 200 milligrams of hydroxychloroquine, steroid lotion and injections since my diagnosis. I've also been taking oral minoxidil and Elodil for two months and most recently, four days ago, one milligram of finasteride. I saw my derm today who says it's all quiet, apart from a small section in the front. She advised to stop Elodil, no steroid lotion for three weeks, after more injections today. She didn't think it worsened, although I think it did marginally. She's also given me a diagnosis of pattern hair loss today. I've seen her three times since May and can't really fault her. I've just turned 48 and hate this disease. My question is this. When I had blood tests back in May, my serum ferritin was 5. I've been taking 600 milligrams of iron for the past two months. Prior to that, I was taking... I was taking one tablet per day since January. Since starting these meds, I seem to be seeing some regrowth. In your opinion... Could getting my ferritin levels back up above 20, and preferably higher, have any effect on FFA? My derm says this is one of the lowest she's ever heard of, and I guess I'm grasping at straws that something else could help this insidious disease. Thank you so much. So ferritin of 5 
is low. Ferritins can be 2, 1. But a ferritin of 5 is low, and one thing which is certain with a ferritin of 5 is it's probably not helping the hair, and it's probably causing hair loss. And so, in this particular situation, it sounds like there's a diagnosis of frontal fibrosing alopecia, a diagnosis of androgenetic hair loss, and quite likely here an uh, telogen effluvium from the low iron. It's unlikely that bringing up iron will help frontal fibrosing alopecia. Not impossible, but unlikely. But it's likely that it'll help the telogen effluvia, and it's likely that it'll sprout hair, and it's likely that the density will improve. And so by bringing up iron to 20, 25, 30, then we're really eliminating that from the picture. And it's possible that by reducing the telogen effluvium from the picture, that the androgenetic hair loss will be more stable. Sometimes in the setting of telogen effluvium, androgenetic hair loss is a little more unstable. Very likely within nine months, if the FFA can be kept under pretty good control and the androgenetic hair loss can be kept under pretty good control, the result will be more hair. Now, if the FFA is very active and progressing, 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 then uh, the end result might not be more hair, but a ferritin of 5 is very low, and certainly a ferritin of 5 is likely to be impacting hair loss. And I think that by bringing up the ferritin to 20 or more, that there'll be an improvement of the hair because we've eliminated the telogen effluvium. So thanks for that. Question 6. Are there different types of LPP distribution? For example... One single lesion that expands versus several smaller lesion that joins one another. In affirmative case, is one type harder to treat than the other? So there's lots of LPP types. So there's the classic LPP type, where a person develops redness, itchy burning, and has an, a number of areas of tenderness on the scalp, often accompanied by hair shedding. Then there's a type that kind of affects the, the, the entire scalp. It's red. Uh, in many ways, it, it can resemble seborrheic dermatitis. It's red. It's scaly. It's often itchy. It's tender. It's shedding. Then there's an, an LPP type, which some consider a type of what we call pseudopalod, which is less scaly, but associated with patches of scarring, often in the central scalp. Then there's the frontal fibrosing alopecia type, which affects the frontal scalp. There's a type called Graham Little, which affects underarm hair and pubic hair. Then there's a type which overlaps with androgenetic hair loss, and the immune system is attacking miniaturizing hairs. There's a type which overlaps with folliculitis decalvans, where there's pustules on the scalp, pimples, and there's drug-induced LPP. So there's lots of different LPP types. And here the question asks, is there a difference between one patch that wants to expand and many little patches that wants to fuse? And the answer is yes. It hasn't been well studied, but uh, there is. And the single patch of LPP that wants to expand is generally easier to treat than the multiple patch that wants to fuse. Why that is, we don't know. But often in a a situation where there's one focal area of LPP for some reason, the use of topical steroids, steroid injections, topical tacrolimus, uh, as well as systemic agents, doxycycline, hydroxychloroquine, uh, can be a bit more effective than the, um, the, the second type which wants to fuse. But again, there's, there's no precise response that people have, and, and people respond differently. Some people have a type of diffuse LPP that responds extremely well to topical clobetazole. You just can't believe how well this responded. Other people have a single patch that just keeps growing and it doesn't respond to much. 
So everyone is different, and that's what's so important to keep in mind with hair loss is that everyone does respond a bit differently. But generally speaking, a type of scarring alopecia with one focal area, and that's the only area involved, does tend to respond better. There's something about the immune system in that situation that is a little bit easier to uh, settle down with medications. Question 7. Is there an association with lichen planopilaris and hepatitis C? Is there an association with lichen planopilaris and hepatitis C vaccine? So the answer is not really. It's a great question. There is an association with lichen planus. And lichen planus and lichen planopilaris are cousins. Lichen planus is this condition for which there's itchy, purpley bumps on the body. Some patients have oral lichen planus affecting the mouth or the genital area. There is an association between lichen planus, skin lichen planus, and hepatitis C. Most people with lichen planus don't have hepatitis C, but there's about a five or a six-fold increased chance that a person has uh, hepatitis C, at least in some studies. We don't see that with lichen planopilaris. And some people call lichen planopilaris lichen planus of the hair follicle. And why that is, we don't know. Is it standard to test for hepatitis C in patients with lichen planopilaris? No, it's not. Is it standard in some parts of the world to test for hepatitis C in lichen planus? In some parts of the world it is, especially if there's a higher prevalence of lichen planus. Uh, hepatitis C, because we know this relationship exists. And so when you start reading about lichen planus, lichen planus, lichen planus, you'll see this relationship to hepatitis C. And you can test for hepatitis C with a simple blood test, but we don't tend to see that in lichen planopilaris or LPP, and nor with a vaccine as well. Question eight. How does being overweight or obese influence the course of lichen planopilaris? Not only the disease itself, but can the obese influence the doses of the medications? This is a great question. The short answer is there's some relationship, but we don't understand it yet. And so let's take a look at this together. It's not really clear yet how obesity influences LPP. It just hasn't been studied very well. It has been studied in other areas of hair medicine. For example, Individuals who are, are obese are more likely to have more rapidly progressive androgenetic hair loss. We know that obesity increases the amount of inflammation present in the body, this adipose-related inflammation. So we know it's relevant. We just don't yet know how it's relevant, especially in LPP where we haven't studied it yet. But we do know that patients with lichen planopilaris are at increased risk to be obese. Increased risk to have high cholesterol, high blood sugars, and high blood pressure. Now, keep in mind that's an increased risk. It doesn't mean that all patients with LPP have high blood pressure, obesity, high cholesterol, or high blood sugars. It just means the risk is increased compared to the general population. So we know there's this, this relationship, but what we don't know is what you're asking, and that is, does this obesity in turn affect the lichen planopilaris? We don't know. It's certainly possible, and I think it's, it's a really important question, because I think the second question that's asked is, if one loses weight, does LPP become more manageable under better control? That we don't know yet. These are, are really wonderful questions. 
And I suspect that there may be some effect, but whether it's a little bit of an effect, a little more of a, than a little, or a little, little more than a little, we don't know. And so these are great questions that need to be, need to be researched. What about the medications? Well, generally in the world of hair loss, we try to dose medications a little bit more conservatively according to a person's ideal body weight. So we try not to be too influenced by body weight, especially with mild changes. But absolutely, there are some medications like hydroxychloroquine, isotretinoin, cyclosporin, that we use for scarring alopecia that are influenced by body weight to some degree. Higher the body weight, the more medication we use. Now, for some of these medications, we do try hard, especially hydroxychloroquine, to dose it more towards ideal body weight if we can, and be a little bit more conservative if we can. But the answer is yes, there are some medications where body weight does come to influence the amount of medication that's used. Prednisone would also be one of them. Some medications we use for scarring alopecia like methotrexate, doxycycline, low-dose naltrexone, mycophenolate, mofetil, the person's body weight doesn't even come into the equation. And so the answer to your question is yes. In some cases, we, body weight is influenced. But I think it's such a great question because there is this inflammation that occurs with obesity and this inflammation is acting systemically, not only on the hair, but on other parts of the body. And um, it, it certainly is possible that it affects the hair. We just don't know. I think it's very much ready to, to be studied carefully. So thanks for that. Does weight loss put LPP in remission? Don't know yet. Don't know yet. Question 10. I'm a 33-year-old Caucasian female, and my biopsy was positive for cicatricial alopecia, most consistent with CCCA. The literature I'm reading says it almost exclusively shows up in African-American women. What is the estimated prevalence in Caucasian women? And are there any other differential diagnoses that should be considered? Great, great question. So LP, uh, CCCA that occurs in a Caucasian female is likely like in Plano pilaris. LPP and CCCA have very similar pathology. Very similar. Some experts in pathology may say that the appearance of the hairs, the so-called eccentric thinning of the root sheath, the premature desquamation of the root sheath, would favor CCCA if a real expert is looking at the slide. But generally speaking, what happens is a slide is given to the pathologist and the pathologist says, primary lymphocytic scarring alopecia consistent with lichen plano pilaris or central centrifugal cicatricial alopecia, clinical correlation needed. What the pathologist is saying is, this is an LPP, CCCA lookalike. They look alike, so you, clinician, you go tell me what it is. They're, this, they're so similar. If you think it's LPP, then put LPP on the page. If you think it's CCCA, then put CCCA on the page. The pathology is very similar. If the patient is a 33-year-old black female, probably more consistent with CCCA, although we can have LPP. But if it's a 33-year-old Caucasian female, it's more likely LPP is the diagnosis and CCCA would be not the correct terminology to use in this particular situation. Now, of course, there can be exceptions, but that would be extremely rare. And um, I suspect that uh, that's what's going on here. There are some parts of the world, geographically, 
where the pathologist doesn't call it lichen plano pilaris or, or CCCA. They just say primary lymphocytic scarring alopecia. Dear doctor, you give it the you give it the name LPP or CCCA. Other parts of the world, they put both names in the biopsy report, CCCA or LPP, which confuses everybody. And some places in the world, you just don't find CCCA in the report ever, even if it's a biopsy in a black woman. And the only thing you see in the report is LPP. And so patients go the rest of their life with, I have LPP. When that 33-year-old black woman doesn't have LPP, she has CCCA. And so the key message here is that LPP and CCCA, CCCA have identical pathology for the most part. And for those of you who are interested, wonderful study, 2005, by my colleague Dr. Mirmarani at, uh, from UCSF. It was such a nice study because they gave pathologists biopsies of CCCA and LPP. And the pathologist didn't know what they were. They were totally blinded to, the, to what the diagnosis was. They just were given the slide under the microscope. And the pathologist, world class, the top of the top, you can't get much better than this, could not distinguish LPP and CCCA. So that's such an important message. So these have very similar pathology. And so for those out there who feel that, ah, I can tell CCCA under the microscope anytime. Well, if the pathologists in this 2005 study couldn't, then I believe it's pretty challenging sometimes. So they share similar pathology. Question 11. I have two questions related to the use of minoxidil. One, should I be using it on the perimeter of my hair as well where I have active disease? Not sure if this is helping or causing more irritation. So I would need to see the scalp to know exactly what's going on, to tell where to use the minoxidil. But the principle is the same. Minoxidil cheers on hairs. So it should be applied to any area that needs cheering. If there's an area of the scalp which doesn't really need cheering, because there's not much hair loss there or just doesn't need cheering, then it shouldn't go there. And so that's that's the, the, the basic concept. If the perimeter of an area is thinning and it needs a little bit of cheering because we're worried that it's kind of sluggish, it's going to go to sleep soon, then absolutely we should apply it to the perimeter. If there's an area that needs cheering, then it should be applied. Now, the thing I, I would like to mention here is that I don't generally use minoxidil in active scarring alopecia. So if there's lots of itching, lots of burning, lots of shedding, lots of shedding, lots of itching, lots of burning, lots of tenderness, I don't use minoxidil. I wait personally until the scarring alopecia is a little more quiet before I introduce minoxidil. The reason is, is that sometimes minoxidil increases shedding, increases redness, increases itching. And so I want to figure out first if we're winning, beating the scarring alopecia before I add the minoxidil. Because if I think we're winning and I add minoxidil and now we're itching again and shedding, is this from the minoxidil or is it from the scarring alopecia that's acting up? So personally, that's why I wait. But the answer is to the question, you can use minoxidil wherever you think there's thinning. Question two. I find it extremely difficult to measure out a cap full of foam and then try to get it on the, out of the cap and onto my crown. I tend to squirt some on my hand, rub it in the tips of my fingers, apply it to the scalp. I don't measure the amount I'm using anymore. I could typ it typically lasts one can per month. I'm assuming I'm not applying too much. Is there a danger in using too much? Can I potentially, can using potentially too much increase my shedding? So 20 years ago, we used to, uh, the hair loss community used to be really nervous about using too much minoxidil. But now that we are giving people oral minoxidil pills and we're learning what happens when you 
put the medicine into the blood vessels and pump it around the body, we're not quite as worried nowadays as we used to be with oral mono with topical minoxidil. It is possible to use too much, and we'll come to that in a minute. But one can per month is equivalent to half a cap twice a day, or one full cap daily. A full can a month with squirting on the hand, rubbing in your fingers, and putting it in the scalp means some is lost, and so there's even less than that. But what are the problems when using too much? Suppose you used a can every two weeks, or squirted double the amount on your hand and rubbed it in your hands. Well, many people are fine. But some people get headaches, some people get dizziness, some people do get extra hair on the face. Some people, if they do overuse topical minoxidil, do get swelling around the face, the eyes. Some people do get palpitations. And once every two years, three years, a patient who's just overdoing the minoxidil three caps a day winds up in the emergency room with chest pain. So you can overdo it. Fortunately for most people, it's okay. But there are some people that are really sensitive to minoxidil. There are some people that apply minoxidil. And they say, you know, for the next hour, I look on my Fitbit, on my watch, and my heart rate goes up by 10. It goes from 62 to 72 to 75 for an hour. Some people are sensitive to it. And so it really depends on the person. But for a person that's using minoxidil and they find they're just fine and they've got the routine down, the goal really is to work with that routine. And sometimes the clinician may feel that you're tolerating it really well based on what you're doing. You could uh, you know, try 10% more or 20% more. Uh, sometimes a physician will say, no, you've got hair on the face or the headaches that you have is a, is a sign you're using too much. So it does come down to a case-by-case -case type scenario, but you can use too much minoxidil. Are there people out in the world using a cap of minoxidil instead of half a cap? Absolutely. Are there people out in the world using two caps? Absolutely. Is this the standard? No. You just turn over the bottle and you see it's a half a cap. So it all comes down to a patient-by-patient -patient type understanding of the scenario, but absolutely you can use too much minoxidil. That's the, the short answer. Any advice on how best to apply minoxidil? Well, the goal is to get what's in this can onto the scalp in the minimal steps possible. And so generally, the way that minoxidil should be applied is a part is made down the middle first, assuming that it's being used for androgenetic hair loss. So a part is made down the middle, and then the minoxidil is taken out of the cap and placed down there. And then another part is made a quarter of an inch or half an inch over to the left, and some minoxidil is placed down that part. And then another part made to the other side, and finally another two on either side. So five parts, for example. The goal is to get it on the scalp skin as opposed to the hair the best you can. And not to forget to go back to the back if there's androgenetic hair loss in the back. Many people do a wonderful job treating the front and they kind of forget about the back. And so they come back in to see me nine months later and the front is doing so well and the back is doing worse. So don't forget the back. But as you become comfortable the, the goal really is to make it quick. And for experienced patients that have been using it a long time, I'm absolutely okay if they use their own modified technique, provided it's helping. So if I see a patient back, and they're doing fantastic, they're getting so much regrowth. And they tell me, I want to tell you how I'm applying it. I can tell you one thing before they even start talking. I like what they're doing because it's working. So if a patient says to me, I want to tell you what I'm doing, I take this comb and I part it this way and I put a bobby pin in here and I take this and I do that, 
It's fine with me because I know it's working. If it's not working and a patient comes back to see me, it could be that they are not a non-responder to minoxidil, or I do have to listen carefully to their technique. But I want my patients to get the minoxidil on within five minutes. There are patients, absolutely, in my practice, many, that take 20 minutes, 25, 30, 35 minutes. It's a, it's a routine, it's a chore. It's, it's a big deal to do the minoxidil session each day. And I would rather it, it not take that long because much of the medication just dissolves nicely on its own. If there is some that gets in the hair, it's not great, but it's no big deal. Some of it still will end up on the scalp, but much of it still ends up on the scalp anyways. But the goal really is to make those parts and apply the minoxidil to the skin in between those parts. So that is, <laughs> that is what I anticipated would be the end of one hour. So I was pretty close. Um, so I will keep going. But should you wish to leave us at any time, uh, please do. We have a lot more fantastic questions that, that are here. And so we will now head into the second movement of webinar scarring alopecia. Question 14. Is it possible to reverse pili torti hairs caused by LPPFFA? Have you personally seen this reversal? So what is a pili torti? Pili torti. It's a twisting of hairs that sometimes happens in the setting of scarring alopecia. It can happen in other things. So the finding of a curved hair doesn't necessarily mean scarring alopecia. You can see this hair is a little bit twisty. This is what the hair normally does. And if you see this hair, you can see that it's a lot more twisty kinky. And you can also see that there's a lot less hair around this hair. So this is an, a more advanced scarring alopecia. Oh, so the answer is that um, if the pili torti is in a very early stage, it's beginning its twisting, and it's not extremely, extremely kinked, it is possible to reverse some of it. It may not reverse completely, but it is possible to reverse some of it, especially with the use of some good conditioners. And it may take a while to find the conditioner that works great for the hair type, but a significant improvement can occur, especially when we treat the scarring alopecia aggressively. We, we settle it down. In the setting of very kinked hairs, uh, we generally can't reverse it. That uh, twisting is, is permanent. But in the early stages, it is possible to reverse that twisting. those hairs as they're coming through the skin with all the inflammation and fibrosis, you know, take on this kink. And as we settle that inflammation, um, sometimes we improve the hair growth properties. Question 15. Do you think stem cell hair transplants could be the answer for burnt out FFA? I'm hoping that stem cell hair transplants will be FDA approved in the next few years. So thanks for this question. It's certainly possible um, that techniques like this could be. I think techniques like stem cell hair transplants for FFA are probably a lot further out than just a few years. So I, there's not really uh, a lot of good evidence in the year 2023 that a technique like this would help FFA. So it's um, a little bit theoretical at this point. But... Um, Things can change fast, and so anything is possible. But right now, we don't have a lot of evidence that this particular technique would be all that useful for burnt out FFA to regrow hair. But research is ongoing, and um, more data may accumulate. But right now, we, we don't have that as, as a, a top option on our radar. Adding to the previous question, could you also comment on hair cloning for scarring alopecia? They both seem to be the solution for FFA patients once they're stabilized. Both seem to be around 10 years before they're available. What are your thoughts? 
Hair cloning is something which has been discussed for a while, and there are some uh, groups that are studying hair cloning. I don't think we can put 10 years on it because we, we really don't know that. We don't even have a number for hair cloning in FFA. There hasn't been any good studies that convincingly shows that hair cloning helps FFA. And so I think first we need those particular studies that convincingly show a regenerative ability of that technique. But um, it's certainly a technology that's exciting to watch and uh, could be a possible treatment option in the years ahead. But it's not really something that I'm following very closely right now for FFA. But that can change as research improves. I'm wondering if you can address the safety of using dutasteride for the treatment of FFA. My doctor asked me if I had any family history of cancer before prescribing it. So as we said earlier, for finasteride, most studies in males suggest that it doesn't cause cancer, especially breast cancer, but there is that one study suggesting a possible increased risk. But there's no evidence of breast cancer in women, either suggesting it increases the risk or suggesting it doesn't cause any risk. So we just don't have that data. But for spironolactone, we do have three studies that suggest that it does not increase the risk of breast cancer. And spironolactone is now used in patients with a history of breast cancer when there's no evidence that women using spironolactone have a higher risk of recurrence or the cancer coming back. So we need better studies addressing finasteride and dutasteride use in women with breast cancer. Uh, as I mentioned, the standard of care in North America has tended to be not to use it if there's other options that can be considered. But we are starting to see in our literature some use of finasteride and dutasteride in women with breast cancer. So we'll have to follow this literature closely, and um, we need more data in this area. It's clearly an important subject. I'm hoping you can comment on if there are any benefits to avoiding hair care products that contain fragrance. I have FFA and have allergy testing that did not appear to have allergy to fragrances. However, I'm wondering if, I, if it's still beneficial to avoid hardcore products with fragrance. Thanks for this question. It's important to keep in mind that fragrances can cause allergic contact dermatitis, and they can also cause irritant contact dermatitis. So even if they don't cause true allergy, they can sometimes irritate. The short answer is, if someone has patch tested negative and they don't appear to have fragrance allergies, do they really need to avoid fragrances? Well, we don't know. It would seem that the simplest answer would be, should be okay. But I think that if one uses certain products, shampoos, and their scalp just seems more irritated or more red, then I think it is a sign that something is just not quite right with the topical products that the person is using. Whether it's allergic contact dermatitis or irritant contact dermatitis is, is not clear, or whether there's a folliculitis that's occurring, or this particular product is affecting the presence of seborrheic dermatitis or dandruff on the scalp. All these things need to be considered. And I have a really low threshold to saying to patients, let's try a hypoallergenic shampoo. And there's several on the market. And one can even experiment with making up their own hypoallergenic products. But the products that we use in our shampoos, in our conditioners, in our hairsprays, they, they need to be kept in mind as potential culprits. And if one is patch tested negative, I'm a little less worried. 
but I still have a low threshold to, to saying, let's, let's go with a hypoallergenic shampoo for a while. Like Vanna Cream Free and Clear, like Scene Shampoo, and there are others as well. Devoid of fragrance, devoid of cocamidopropobetane, which is a sudsing agent, devoid of preservatives like MCI, MI, formaldehyde releasers. Um, I have a low threshold for that, if, if possible. My blood work was normal, but shows I have high ferritin and alanine aminotransferase levels, a liver enzyme. Can you talk about medical indicators like the above, which may lead to or be an aggravating factor for scarring alopecia? So this is a situation where I really need to know more information about the person's story. Ferritin is a measure of iron storage in the body, but it's also a measure of inflammation, and we often forget that. So ferritin has two jobs. It tells us about inflammation in the body, and it tells us about how much iron is stored away in the bank. And what's so critical in this question is how high is the ferritin? Ferritin ranges from zero or one or five, like a, a previous participant had in her question. But ferritin levels can be 10,000 in certain hemophagocytic syndromes, serious diseases in, in the intensive care setting, so very sick patients. But ferritin can be, you know, 145 and 162 and uh, you know a patient says it's high and that's correct it is high but remember ferritin ranges from one to ten thousand or more so in a question like this I, I need to know and similarly what the liver enzyme is a liver enzyme can be 61 and the patient says it's high it's high or it can be you know 905 and uh, everybody's worried so the, the numbers really do matter. But there's many causes of high ferritin. Inflammation can cause high ferritin. A liver disease called hemochromatosis, where the body absorbs too much iron, can cause high ferritin. Cancers can cause high ferritin. Alcohol can cause high ferritin. Other liver diseases can cause high ferritin. Infection can cause high ferritin. And obesity can cause high ferritin. So there's a lot of reasons to have high ferritin. Some aren't, aren't all that worried. Some and the same goes with an elevated liver enzyme. So it's important to review with your doctor what the levels are. If ferritin is a little elevated and liver enzymes are a little elevated, usually we don't worry very much. We might repeat it. We'll have to decide if we want to send the patient off for a liver ultrasound, but that's something you and your family doctor can, can talk about. But it depends on the level. If liver enzymes are sky high, uh, you know, 600 then we're in a different stage of thinking than if the liver enzymes are 64, 71, less than three times above normal. But fatty liver disease, which is now undergoing a renaming for what it's called, it used to be called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's very common in our population. It causes elevated liver enzymes and causes elevated ferritin. Alcohol can cause elevated liver enzymes. Some medications can cause elevated liver enzymes and elevated ferritin. Infections can, and so can hemochromatosis. So um, there's lots of reasons to have elevated ferritin and, and liver enzymes. We know that patients with lichen planopilaris are at increased risk to have obesity, high cholesterol, uh, metabolic syndrome, and possibly fatty liver disease. And so it's possible that that can be explained in some patients by, by that. But really, this is something that just needs to be reviewed uh, carefully with one's physician. I have been working through hair loss, which is presenting a scarring, and I'm trying to do everything I can to reverse my symptoms. Are there other lines of defense in addition to the usual suspects, minoxidil, spiro, injections, birth control? For instance, anti-inflammatory diets, red lights, specialty shampoos, supplements, topical oils. So 
when, when I hear a question like this, my my feeling is we need to know 100% sure that this is scarring. Lots of things look like scarring, present as scarring. They're itchy and they're red, but they're not scarring. And so in this particular question, are there any lines of defense in addition to the usual suspects? Minoxidil, spiro, birth control, these aren't treatments for scarring alopecia. So these are treatments for androgenetic hair loss. And so in this particular question, I think first and foremost, we need to know whether this is truly scarring alopecia or not, or whether it's just felt to be scarring. But if we're not 102% sure, then you need a biopsy. Simple as that. We have to be we have to be absolutely sure that we know what we're dealing with because the treatments are different for androgenetic hair loss than scarring alopecia. And uh, we don't treat active rip roaring scarring alopecia with minoxidil, spironolactone, or oral contraceptives. I've been diagnosed with FFA since 2013. I'm unable to take oral minoxidil because of palpitations. I've been taking dutasteride and now methotrexate. I have no itching, but my hairline continues to recede. What is the methotrexate going to achieve? So thanks very much for this. Methotrexate is what we call a second line agent. And so when I think about lichen planopilaris treatments, I divide it into three categories or three buckets. First line, or the gold medal treatments, second line, or the silver medal treatments, and third line, or the bronze treatments. And methotrexate sits here as a second line treatment, so there's evidence for the use of methotrexate in lichen plano pilaris. And so the question is, the hairline continues to recede. It's been started in May. It can take two or three months for methotrexate to, to work. 50, this is FFA. 50% 50 of patients on methotrexate can have an improvement, but not everybody. And so it may be that time is needed more to see if the methotrexate is going to work, but it could be that methotrexate doesn't work here. And so by measuring the distance between the eyebrow and the hairline, we can get a sense if the disease is stopping by looking at the inflammation around the hairs, the redness around the hairs, we can get a sense if the inflammation is stopping and the disease is stopping, uh, and if the methotrexate truly is working. Is there any point in continuing either of these two meds, especially from the side effects of dutasteride, low libido, and depression? What else can I take instead to keep the disease at bay? Well, it's important to keep in mind there's potential side effects and side effects. So potential side effects are the side effects which could occur. And then side effects are the things that do occur. And dutasteride can cause uh, depression and low libido, but they are relatively infrequent. So it's a big difference here if one is worried about the potential side effects or if one is worried about the actual side effects which have occurred and are, are confirmed to be due to the drug. So if one is worried about potential side effects, I'm worried that it could lead to low libido or could lead to depression. That's something that can be monitored and the dose reduced or stopped if it's found that that is occurring. If that is a side effect which is occurring, then a decision has to be made, you know, whether to, to, to stop it. But... There are other agents which can be used in FFA. Um, and in this case, we have methotrexate and dutasteride. Isotretinoin is an option which can be used in FFA. Topical pemecrolimus can be used in FFA. Off-label use of the topical JAK inhibitors can be used. Oral antihistamines like oral cetirizine can be used. 
low-dose naltrexone sometimes can be used, and all these agents I just mentioned have reasonably good safety. One can also consider whether use of hypoallergenic shampoos is appropriate to introduce into the treatment plan. And then if these agents are not helpful, then stronger and stronger immunosuppressants can be considered, such as hydroxychloroquine, such as uh, doxycycline, such as the JAK inhibitors like tofacitinib. So the hope is that methotrexate shuts off the disease. It can take a few months before methotrexate really announces what it, what it wants to do. So it may be time, but uh, about 50% of people with FFA will have some response to methotrexate. Question 22. Is there any point in getting a biopsy to confirm whether a disease is still active? And also if I have, F have AGA? So in my opinion, the answer is no that we don't need a biopsy to determine if scarring alopecia is active. We ask ourselves, is the hair loss spreading? In other words, is it, is it getting worse or is it just staying the same or getting better? If it's spreading, then it's active. If it's getting worse, it's active. If it's not getting worse, then you ask yourself, did I wait long enough? Did I... Did I wait a year? Am I comparing pictures from one year ago to today, or am I comparing pictures from last week to today? If you're comparing pictures a year ago, and it looks the same as today, it's not getting any worse, then there's a pretty good chance it's inactive. If you're comparing pictures to from two years ago or five years ago, and it, it looks exactly the same, I haven't lost a single hair, then for, for sure it's inactive doesn't matter what the biopsy shows. So the problem is, is that sometimes what happens is people bypass this logic and a person has very stable disease. The treatments are working wonderfully. It's totally frozen. Not, no activity. There's no hair being lost. And you do a biopsy and the pathologist says, there's some inflammation. And then the clinician says, there's inflammation. We need to change the treatment. That inflammation is not doing anything. That inflammation may never do anything. So we really have to let the clinical appearance dictate what to do. And so if you compare photos from a year ago or two years ago and it's unchanged and really there's not much redness in scale, then it's, it's inactive and we don't need biopsies. I don't believe in biopsies, re-biopsying to determine if it's active. It's determined clinically. Are you losing hair or not? Do you have itching, burning pain? How's your eyebrows, eyelashes, body hair? If everything's unchanged... Same, same. It's quiet. I'm not a believer in repeating biopsies. Do you recommend HRT? I'm female, 69. In a situation like this, I probably would not recommend HRT, but that really needs to be reviewed with a clinician. When it comes to HRT, there's a few principles that are really, really important. If one is considering HRT for the management of perimenopausal or menopausal symptoms like hot flashes, poor sleep, mood changes, then absolutely HRT can be considered and should be considered. These should be open discussions with one's family physician or internist. But I don't generally recommend HRT be initiated for the purpose of helping hair loss. I'm not a great fan of that, but I'm okay with the HRT being brought on board for the management of menopausal or perimenopausal symptoms. The reason with the hair loss issues is that it's not consistently effective, first of all. 
The second thing is the day you start HRT, you should have some kind of a discussion about when to stop. Now that's changing a bit in recent years in terms of when HRT should be stopped and the safety of long-term use. It's, it's changing since we're a little more comfortable with longer-term HRT than we were 20 years ago. But generally speaking, the day you start HRT, you kind of want to have a discussion about when to stop. And I don't really like the possibility of having to remove that plan, that HRT from the plan. Because what sometimes happens is HRT is started, you get shedding, there's some uh, telogen effluvium, there's maybe some mild benefit, and then when the HRT is stopped, there's another telogen effluvium, sometimes mild, but sometimes significant, and an acceleration of, of hair loss. And so what started out to be a, a good idea ends up being a worsening of hair loss. So if the HRT is needed for menopausal or perimenopausal symptoms, yes. And so if a patient is 69 and um, has been on HRT and is deciding uh, whether to continue it, and individuals who's using it long term, that's a discussion that needs to be had with one's family physician or gynecologist. But uh, not to let those decisions be based on the hair, in my opinion. And everybody has a slightly different opinion about that. But not to let the hair enter into the decisions about HRT. Question 24. Regarding the inverse vaccine study below, would this be promising for scarring alopecia? So new studies have come out with these inverse vaccines, which essentially removes the immune system's memory of one molecule by tagging a molecule in a certain way. We allow the immune system to develop tolerance of a molecule so it doesn't attack it. So the question here is, are these helpful for scarring alopecia? The short answer is we don't know. But the longer answer is, is that scarring alopecias are quite complex. And they are a little bit different than some pure autoimmune diseases where we know what the immune system is attacking. In multiple sclerosis, the immune system is attacking the myelin sheath. In, you know, diabetes, we know, type 1 diabetes, we know where in the pancreas it's attacking. So in classic autoimmune diseases where we know the molecular target, this inverse vaccine could be very helpful. The issue in hair loss, these scarring alopecias, is they have features of autoimmune diseases, but they have also features of more general, broad immune diseases. And so it's a little bit harder to yet find the target. Now, it could be that some are very much classic autoimmune diseases, but they don't behave exactly the same way as type 1 diabetes, as vitiligo, as rheumatoid arthritis as multiple sclerosis. So whether these inverse vaccines would have the same role, it's hard to say. But that's what research is for. Question 25. I was diagnosed with LPP about five and a half years ago, but I never experienced itching, burning, or tenderness, only pain. I have tried several treatments, Celsept, low-dose naltrexone, but mostly used Zelgens, which is tofacitinib, clobetazole, or betamethasone, and more recently, tacrolimus ointment, three times a week, since my derm believes I need to reduce my steroid use. I also do Kenalog injections every six weeks, even though I have never felt they've helped. Question. Even though my scalp is still red, and I shed very little, since I only have painful spots, but it moves around to different areas of the scalp, is it possible that I have scalp dysesthesia, per your article, or something else other than LPP? So the short answer is it's possible. The longer answer is it's, it's interesting and I would need to see the scalp. 
in a situation like this where things are pretty calm, but there's pain that moves around, one certainly wonders about whether there is truly still active scarring alopecia, whether there's an allergic contact dermatitis that's present. So the scarring alopecia is pretty quiet, but there's this allergic contact dermatitis from the shampoo or conditioner or hairspray you're using, and it, it's kind of aggravating things and adding complexity to things. There could be a steroid withdrawal phenomenon here where it's just it's so much clobetazole and so much steroid, and I'm just giving an example. It may not be in your situation. But when you start tapering steroid that's been used a long time, you sometimes get all these symptoms and acting up, and it's, it's challenging. That's called steroid withdrawal. There could be a true dysesthesia, which is nerves firing when they should be quiet. They're firing. And in a situation like this, we always have to think about seborrheic dermatitis and psoriasis here. Is there, in fact, seborrheic dermatitis that's making the situation so much more complex? And what's needed here is a dandruff shampoo to take away the, the malassezia yeast on the scalp and settle things down. So it's hard to say. This is obviously a complex situation. But generally speaking, if more and more aggressive treatments are used, and the pain goes away, then I'm more likely to feel that this is inflammatory, active scarring alopecia, or allergic contact dermatitis, or seborrheic dermatitis. If more and more anti-inflammatory treatments are used and it has no effect, dandruff shampoos are used and it has no effect, then I'm more likely to think it's a dysesthesia. If, and very rarely we do this, we put the patient on prednisone or topical steroids more generously or steroid injections more generously. And they say, I have tremendous relief. I've never been more calm in my whole life. Then that's again suggesting an inflammatory issue or steroid withdrawal. And so... In a situation like this, uh, the story is really important, and what happens with each, with each treatment is really important. So it, it's a complex situation. Uh, I would need to know more about the story, but um, keeping a really close diary is really helpful. And sometimes what we do in a situation like this is we use a hypoallergenic dandruff shampoo. So we've removed the allergic contact dermatitis component. We're hitting it with the malassezia to kill the dandruff. And uh, we keep everything else the same for a while. We see what happens. And if the patient feels tremendous relief with that, then we know, oh, wow, there, there's either dandruff or allergic contact dermatitis here. Or if it had no role and the patient's still painful, then we have to decide, okay, do we, do we now plunge ahead and treat the dysesthesia by starting low-dose naltrexone or gabapentin or topical gabapentin or another nerve agent? Or do we pursue the steroid withdrawal phenomenon by giving more steroids for a short time? So complex situation, but very interesting. Uh, it's certainly possible that it's a dysesthesia. So we've come to the end of the second movement. So we will plunge ahead into three. And I want to thank everyone for these wonderful questions. These are really terrific questions. And so I'm so honored that you've sent them our way. And uh, it's my, my honor to answer them. There's currently a shortage of oral minoxidil. Pharmacies are out of stock and are having to carry different manufacturers. Is it okay to switch manufacturers? Should we be concerned about new side effects and or additional shed? It's a great question because it's possible that these different pharmacies compounding the oral minoxidil do it slightly differently, and it's not perfectly the same as the pill. There hasn't been any great studies, but 
there are certainly patients that are doing so well by cutting their minoxidil 1.25 or taking the whole pill 2.5, and now there's a shortage, and now they have to search for compounded pills, and now they're not doing so well. Is it the stress that they had? They just got, you know, they just lost their job. Is it the COVID infection they just had? They have COVID and they're shedding because of COVID. Or is it because of this minoxidil pill that was changed? It's sometimes hard to figure out. Can minoxidil pills be made up wrong? We know they can. My colleague in Spain, Dr. Vano, published wonderful studies showing some errors that occurred with oral minoxidil. And so we know that human error can occur. Fortunately, we think it doesn't occur that often. But um, if there's no other choice, then the short answer is it's okay to switch manufacturers. We have to, we have to keep going with the oral minoxidil because the other scenario stopping altogether is almost certainly going to lead to hair loss. But if at all possible, I would rather the patient continue the same minoxidil source, if possible. Simple as that. Do a lot of people have equal success when they switch? One pill, this manufacturer, compounded here and there? Yes, they do. Many patients do just as, just as well. So it's just something that has to be on the mind. Question 27. I was diagnosed at the end of February with FFA. Dutasteride, 5 milligrams, 5 days, and 2 days, 2 milligrams minoxidil. And 5 days, 1 milligram, and isotretinoin, 5 milligrams, 2 days a week, and elodil every night. I had very rapid progress. My dermatologist added naltrexone, 3 milligrams, but it caused me a lot of anxiety, insomnia, anorexia, so I had to stop it. Now with one milligrams of dexamethasone two days a week and the rest, except naltrexone is still stopped. It keeps moving fast. What would be next? My doctor wants to inject plasma, I guess platelet-rich plasma. So in a situation like this, platelet-rich plasma certainly is an option. In my view, platelet-rich plasma would be considered a third line option for FFA. In this particular case, the patient has been prescribed dutasteride, oral isotretinoin, which is a first-line agent, low-dose naltrexone, which is a third-line agent. And so what's next? Well, uh, we have the possibility of steroid injections. We have the possibility of adding topical pemecrolimus, which goes by the trade name Elodil, starting hydroxychloroquine, starting doxycycline, adding hypoallergenic shampoos to the mix. So these would generally be my considerations before starting PRP. There's nothing wrong, per se, with uh, starting PRP next, but in my clinic it would be considered a third-line agent. So I would rather start a patient on you know, steroid injections every two or three months or starting hydroxychloroquine or cetirizine. But... PRP is an, is an option. It's just I would consider it a third-line option. And I think some of those other options I mentioned would be slightly more effective. At least a chance of being slightly more effective. Question 28. I have lichen plano pilaris. This is my fourth year. My questions are, I take baricitinib, clobetazole, minoxidil, and spironolactone. And I've had lengthy periods in the past where my scalp felt like it was LPP-free. And the dermatologist has confirmed this by concluding there's no inflammation. Currently, my LPP is back with a vengeance. As is the itchiness, but thankfully, no added hair loss. Does this mean the baricitinib is not working? Why does it come in waves? So it's hard to say. Sometimes LPP just does this. It comes and goes, comes and goes, comes and goes. In this particular scenario, I'm a little skeptical that the LPP is flaring 
itself all that much. It's not impossible, but it's unlikely, especially with the fact that we're getting symptoms as opposed to no hair loss yet. That's encouraging that the hair isn't being lost. The things that can do this are injury to the scalp. So if you've been doing so well and you went for microneedling, sometimes we see this. If you've been doing so well and you got your hair dyed at a new salon because a friend recommended it and you've never been there before, possible. Vaccines can sometimes do this. COVID infections can sometimes do this. They flare the scalp in patients with LPP. Stress can do this. Medications can do this especially if some medication you were using was reduced or stopped. Sunburns in the summer. If you're just coming off the summer and you live in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, sometimes a sunburn can do this for some patients. Other medications can sometimes do it. And sometimes if allergic contact dermatitis has arrived on the scene, you didn't have an allergy before. You've used this one shampoo for 14 years, it's your favorite shampoo. But now you have an allergy. Can that happen? Absolutely. And so if that happens, what happens is you get redness and you get symptoms flaring and sometimes you don't get much hair loss, but the scalp just feels terrible, itching. And sometimes seborrheic dermatitis has also arrived on the scene, this cousin of dandruff. He never really had much seborrheic dermatitis before, but now for some reason, whatever the reason, there's seborrheic dermatitis. And of course, in the setting of baricitin abuse, we have to think about fungal infections, tinea capitis, not super common in adults, but certainly we need to think about it. it it's not impossible. So a really good up-close exam needs to be done. But there's a lot of reasons for why things could flare. A good history and good exam sometimes can get to the answers, but those are the kind of things we want to think about. The fact that there's no hair loss right now is a very good sign. Question 29. Is there a correlation between LPP and itchy body skin and very dry lips? Is that due to allergies? Well, patients with LPP can develop itchy skin. Most patients don't. Patients can have eczema or, or atopic dermatitis. Usually they've had a history of that before. There's medications that can contribute to dry lips and itchy skin, especially isotretinoin, for example but sometimes other medications as well. You can have rashes with many medications, finasteride, for example, rarely. You can have allergic contact dermatitis. You're using a shampoo, and not only is it running down the scalp, but it runs down the back and the arms and the legs and the body and causes itching, so that has to be considered. Very rarely, skin lichen planus can develop in patients with LPP. Not common, but has to be considered in anyone with itchy skin. You can get immune-mediated uh, drug reactions if you're on any. If you have lichen plano pilaris, your chances of other autoimmune diseases are slightly increased. There's other immune skin diseases that, that can occur. And sometimes you can get immune-mediated drug reactions to other medications that you're on. So... Um, this is one of those situations, again, where a really good history and good examination can be helpful. Um, if there's a rash accompanying the itch, sometimes a, a biopsy can be helpful. There are certain features that can be uncovered in a, in a skin biopsy. Uh, features of lichen planus, features of certain drug reactions, features of other immune-mediated diseases of the skin can be captured by a biopsy. So... Be sure to speak to your dermatologist. Whole host of, whole host of uh, possible reasons. Question thirty: Would a functional integrated doctor be of help in my condition as an add-on to Western medicine? So I'm always happy when patients use a whole host of different 
types of therapies to help them get better. But ultimately, the goal is is to help patients stop their hair disease and feel better and get on doing the things they enjoy. The things that are really important when visiting the functional doctor or the integrated specialist is there are certain aspects that I think are worth focusing on. And I think there are certain things that we just have to be aware that there's no evidence. And I'm always happy to speak with patients, practitioners. But I think if we're going to use comments like this disease is due to this and we need this treatment which does this, if it's not backed up by science, I think we just have to be careful. And I think we have to be aware of the possibility that any treatment, whether treatments as we do in my clinic, treatments we do in another country, treatments we do in functional medicine, naturopathic medicine, can worsen the disease. So functional medicine focuses on inflammation, nutritional deficiencies, hormone imbalances, exposure to toxins, microbiome. And the things that are important is, I do think that treatments that improve diet, exercise, sleep, stress, are really, really helpful. And so I'm all for treatments that the functional medicine doctor can do, which enhance those particular areas. But I'm not a great fan of the use of supplements that just do not have any evidence of being helpful in scarring alopecia. Because I think we have to be careful that if we're going to decide to go down a path with no evidence... I just think we have to be prepared to expect anything. And so I encourage patients that are working with my colleagues in other fields to you know to pay pay attention to their stress, their microbiome, their diet, what they eat, how they sleep because I think all these are very very important. But if there are treatments directly applied to the scalp or directly taken for the purpose of affecting the scalp, I would rather the patient not. Unless we've exhausted all of the options. Do some of treatments we use make things worse? Absolutely. Do treatments that are used in other fields of medicine make things worse? Sometimes they do, absolutely. So my general recommendations is to focus on diet, exercise, sleep. I think these are the way to go. And same with integrative medicine. I think that, you know, focusing on these aspects is really, really important. Uh, how people are coping, their emotional health, their stress. I think these are often ignored issues in health, and I think that they need to be discussed and, and be part of a, a complete plan. Absolutely. Question 31. I have lichen plano pilaris. What can I do while waiting for an appointment with a specialist? My dermatologist says she cannot do anything for me, so I'm not getting treatment, except shots. I'm feeling very helpless and feeling like I could possibly have no hair by next June. I have had a lot of steroid shots and have clobetazole, and now topical steroid, mometazone, doxycycline, finasteride, hydroxychloroquine, methotrexate. So the patient wants to know what they can do while waiting. So I think that really comes down to, again, thinking about the first line, second line, and third line options for LPP. And in this particular patient's story, Topical steroids, steroid injections have been used, doxycycline has been used, hydroxychloroquine has been used, methotrexate has been used. 
So what's available? What's left? Well, we have a lot of second line options that can be considered. The antihistamine, cetirizine can be considered. In some countries, goes by the name Zyrtec and others. In other countries, reacting. The topical non-steroid tacrolimus can be considered. Lodos naltrexone can be considered. And other immunosuppressants as well. And so in a situation like this, if the physician does not feel comfortable starting anything else, then um, it could be helpful to discuss some of these possibilities with the physician. If some of these second-line options could be used, some are quite safe with minimal side effects, like some of the antihistamines. Uh, some of the topical non-steroids are fairly well tolerated, like topical tacrolimus, topical permacrolimus. And so it can be challenging while waiting, but I think in scarring alopecia, one of the most important points that I would have is if one can be one's own advocate, it, it goes a long, long way. And it's not easy to be one's advocate. The reason why we do these webinars is because I really want patients to be their own advocates. I want them to be charged with information that allows them to be engaged in these discussions with their physicians to be their own advocates. But with this information here tonight, you can certainly broach some of these subjects with your dermatologist and say, while we're waiting, would you feel comfortable with any of these options that I've heard about or learned about? But it can be challenging. But the other point is that you want to make sure that if hair loss is getting worse and worse and worse and all these treatments have been tried, is the correct, di is the correct diagnosis in fact here? Or are there other diagnoses as well? Is there lichen plano pilaris and other diagnoses? And we also want to make sure in a situation like this that the expectations are correct. Some patients with scarring alopecia have an expectation that they'll get their hair back fully. And sometimes we can improve hair quite a bit. It's quite amazing what can be done. But some patients do come in with the expectation that they're going to get their hair back the way it was. And so if that's the expectation, sometimes what's needed is a, a re-clarification of the actual expectation. But the main point is to continue moving down what we call the treatment ladder. If we've used up all the first line options, we move into the second line options. Simple as that. Question 32. I've been taking oral minoxidil, 1.25 milligrams, since 2022. Have studies shown that 0 0.625 milligrams would have the same effect? I don't want to lose more hair since the minoxidil has helped in the aggressiveness of FFA, I believe. So, when it comes to oral minoxidil and FFA, we don't have a lot of great, great evidence that the oral minoxidil is impacting the FFA. There's a little bit of evidence. We do believe that the oral minoxidil and topical minoxidil are impacting the androgenetic hair loss that's part of the FFA. But there's a little bit of evidence that it might be helping the, the scarring alopecia. But again, it's usually the androgenetic hair loss. But for the vast majority of patients, reducing the dose from 1.25 to 0 0.625 would lead to hair loss. So reducing the dose won't be a good thing. So it's a really, really important decision. Um, so that's a, a key discussion to have with your, your dermatologist. Does minoxidil have an aging effect on the skin? when taken orally, since it does affect collagen synthesis? So a common question. Again, we don't have any evidence in 2023 that is convincing that oral minoxidil accelerates facial aging. It's a very popular topic, but we, we do not have any evidence. So ongoing studies will hopefully resolve this issue. 
but it's certainly not a, a phenomenon that is a common discussion in clinic. So we do discuss it when things are prescribed, but um, the phenomenon of facial aging is not something that that comes up in, in people using these medications. So I think it it deserves more study. Simple as that. Question 34. Do tretinoin creams or serums used on the face irritate the inflammatory response of FFA if applied to the face, not the hairline? The short answer is not usually. Usually they're fine. Um, in fact, sometimes we use retinoids in the management of FFA, but most people using ret retinoids on the face don't have any issues with their FFA. Are there exceptions? Sure, but the vast majority of patients are just fine. Question 35. I'm wondering if scarring alopecia in general is affected by sunlight or only in the case of discoid lupus. So some scarring alopecias are. Discoid lupus is more famous for it, but some forms of lichen plano pilaris are affected by sun or ultraviolet radiation, and uh, these have recently been given the name actinic LPP. Some forms of FFA are similar, and some patients with erosipustular dermatosis of the scalp find that they're UV sensitive as well. So this is a great question, um, but definitely some LPP is worsened in the summer by intense sunlight and patients find that wearing a hat is particularly helpful. Great question. Question 36. One of our family members has LPP. Do you normally have LPP patients use 100 milligrams of doxycycline once a day or twice a day? How long do you keep patients on that dose? Is there a time frame when you transition an LPP patient to the sub-antimicrobial doxycycline, 20 or 40 milligrams. So the thing that's so important to remember in this question is that no two patients are the same. And when you go back to that analogy we used at the beginning of the webinar, that if a stone is rolling down the hill, you might need one person to help stop the stone. You might need three people. Some LPP or FFA is responsive to topical steroids and it goes to sleep. Some needs two treatments. Some needs three and four and five. Some needs 14. Some people respond well to doxycycline 100 milligrams once a day. And so if we don't need 200 milligrams, then we won't use it. So we try to use the lowest possible dose possible. And similarly, how long do we keep on it? The short answer is the least amount of time possible. For some people, that's two months. For some people, it's five years. So there's no template. There's no, you have LPP. This is the protocol you follow. Step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. It would be great if it worked that way, but it doesn't. And so... If a person is going to be started on doxycycline, we keep them on the lowest dose for the low, shortest duration possible. And so it's quite variable. Some patients will do once a day. Some patients do twice a day because the once a day didn't really shut off the disease. Some people do five years because every time they stop, the disease comes back and they couldn't tolerate other treatments. And so a decision was made that I think will continue because you didn't tolerate hydroxychloroquine steroid injections. Da -da 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 so if we want to keep the hair, our decision together is I think we're going to keep going with doxycycline. Are there risks? Yes. But it's quite variable how long we use these medications. But if we don't use doxycycline, we might use topical steroids with the doxycycline or by itself. We might add on hydroxychloroquine. 
So there are other options, but one of the reasons doxycycline is sometimes used is because of its reasonably good safety. How do you monitor for and minimize the chances of developing autoimmune-related gut issues with the long-term use of doxycycline? So we monitor and minimize by paying close attention to any concerns for diarrhea, any concerns for bloating, abdominal symptoms. And if a patient is not really tolerating doxycycline all that well, then we'll consider coming off it. We generally recommend probiotics while a person is on doxycycline, two hours after, two hours before a person uses, but generally after to support the microbiome. Those are challenging because data is kind of in its infancy, but we try to support the microbiome as, as good as we can. And again, using the lowest dose for the shortest duration possible. And if there are safer options, to consider it. So, if a person is not going to try clobetazole topically first, then that is a, a concern because it could be that clobetazole is highly effective for this person and doxycycline is not needed. But of course, the reason we often use doxycycline is because we're using clobetazole, we're using steroid injections, we're using hydroxychloroquine sometimes. We're using a lot of things and we don't feel comfortable yet going to methotrexate, cyclosporin, and other treatments that are more potent immunosuppressants that we use this immune modulatory drug, doxycycline, instead because of its safety. So these are challenging issues and every medication we prescribe, we think about the safety, the affordability, ease of doing it and the effectiveness. That's why sometimes doxycycline comes out as the winner. But these are important considerations and we want to protect the gut health as much as we can. And if there are gut symptoms, we want to reduce and possibly stop the doxycycline. Question 38. From your scarring alopecia frequently asked questions, you indicated that LPP patients can expect to use topical steroids like clobetazole for 18 months or more. In other sections of the website, you talk about the need to be cautious of topical steroids and monitor their frequency and dosing. Therefore, what protocol do you recommend regarding clobetazole for your LPP patients? So there are no protocols. Each patient is taken individually. Some patients use clobetazole twice daily for a couple months before we even think about reducing. Other patients are using clobetazole once a month. So it really depends on the patient. But the same principle applies. We use the least medication we can for the shortest duration possible. And that's really a, a key principle. So... Sometimes when a scarring alopecia has just started and we want to try to put out that fire, we'll use clo clobetazole quite generously and we'll watch for side effects. But short-term clobetazole is generally fairly well tolerated. What I'm worried about is if someone uses clobetazole twice daily for many, 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 many months. Clobetazole twice daily for a short time is okay, provided they're being monitored properly by a physician knowledgeable in the use of clobetazole. But the principles about clobetazole is I think you want to be serious about stopping the disease. So generally, once or twice daily for one to two months is pretty reasonable. But you need a plan for tapering. As soon as you start clobetazole at that frequency, you need to have a plan in place for tapering. And twice daily clobetazole for a few months is not a problem for most patients. But twice daily for 14 years is a major problem for most patients. So we really want to 
be aggressive early on in trying to shut off this disease and telling the immune system that it's not, not doing what it should. And so generally in the early stages, we'll use it fairly often. But a plan has to be in place for reducing it. So next question is, how often do you have them take a steroid holiday and how long are the holidays? So again, it depends on the patient. And if a patient is using clobetazole twice a day, then we want to talk about steroid holidays as soon as possible. If a patient's using clobetazole once a month, steroid holidays are not a topic. So it depends on how much they're using. Steroid holidays are to take a patient using a bit much and make sure they have breaks introduced into their plan so that um, we can enhance safety of the plan. As far as how many bottles to use, generally if a patient is using more than a bottle of clobetazole, a 50, 60 mil bottle, every six weeks, we're going to need some holidays. And we'll need some holidays kind of every two or three months. We're going to need some periods of longer breaks. But if a patient's using little bits of clobetazole once or twice a week, then um, that frequency can be continued provided they're monitored appropriately. And we, we may not need to take a, a holiday or a steroid holiday. And generally a good indicator is how long a bottle lasts, as you've indicated. If a bottle is lasting three months, four months, then this is very low amount of clobetazole and I'm not really worried. If a bottle is lasting two months, it's still not, a, not an incredible amount, but we don't want this to go on for years and years and years. And so the amount of bottles used every month is, is an important kind of landmark in terms of how much clobetazole is being used. You mentioned that the amount of clobetazole patients use is vitally important, and you seem to indicate that one bottle of clobetazole every two weeks is too much. Presumably that's a 50 mil bottle. Since it's hard to measure the amount that a from the bottle, how long should an entire 50 mil bottle last if they're applying it twice a day? And how many days should it last if they're applying it once a day? So it depends on the size of the scarring alopecia. If you imagine a patient with a little golf ball sized scarring alopecia, LPP can sometimes be very focal like this. And if you're applying it twice, day, twice daily to this little golf ball sized area of LPP, a bottle should last you four or five months. But if you're applying it twice daily to most of the entire top of the scalp, then a bottle, last, uh, a bottle might last three weeks in the beginning. So it depends on the area, it depends on the amount of scarring alopecia being treated. Generally speaking, in the first month or two or three or four, I'm okay with a bottle a month. But we're going to watch for side effects. We're going to watch for excessive absorption in the body. We're going to watch for fatigue and mood changes and, you know, things like that. But they're very rare at this dose. But after three or four months, I don't want patients using a bottle a month. If patients are going to be using a bottle a month, it means that we have to bring on other treatments. There's too much responsibility given to clobetazole, and we need other help. We, clobetazole is doing a wonderful job. It's like that person holding up the rock, but we need other people to come on board and help. And uh, I might, we might bring on board pimecrolimus. We might bring on board doxycycline. We might bring on board hydroxychloroquine. We might bring on board cetirizine. So, the number of bottles per month depends on the size of the area. If you're treating the entire scalp, I'm okay with a bottle a month. If you're treating a tiny area of LPP on the scalp, a bottle a month is way too much. 
Do you recommend other topical steroids, such as betamethasone? Absolutely. The principle of treating scarring alopecia is we use the least medicine for the least duration of time, and part of the least medicine is the least potency. And so if we're using clobetazole at each visit, we have to ask ourselves, does this patient really, really need clobetazole twice a day? If not, let's go to once a day. Does this patient really, really need once a day? Let's go to three times a week. Does this patient really, really need three times a week? Let's go to once a week. Does this patient really, really need clobetazole? No, let's go to betamethasone. It's weaker. Hundreds of times, hundreds and hundreds of times weaker. So part of tapering the dose is reducing the amount, but part of tapering is tapering the steroid. Betamethasone is a weak steroid. And so if we don't really need betameth if we don't really need clobetazole, we'll sometimes go to betamethasone. So again, the principles of scarring alopecia are if you don't need to if you do need to use it, use it. If you need to use so much, use so much, provided you're being followed by a knowledgeable physician. If you need to use a strong medication, use a strong medication. But if you don't need to use it, don't use it. And if you don't need to use so much, don't use so much. And if you don't need to use so strong of a medication, don't use so strong of a medication. And so those are some guiding principles that allow us to think about these constantly. And these always have to be on the mind every visit. And so, you know, when patients, pharmacies phone in, can you renew clobetazole? Can you renew clobetazole? Can you renew clobetazole? Sometimes the answer is no, I can't. Because every time the word clobetazole comes up, I have to say to myself, okay, okay. Can you renew clobetazole three times a week? Well, why can't they use it twice a week? I got to see their scalp. Maybe they can use it twice a week. And maybe they don't need clobetazole at all. Maybe we can go to betamethasone. I need to see the patient. So if you're renewing clobetazole month after month after year after year after year after year after year, and these decisions and discussion points aren't going into it, then they may need to be. Question 42. On your handout on your website, on tacrolimus and permecrolimus, you note that you often recommend using them two to six times per week. You also note that they are often used with topical steroids and steroid injections. What protocol for tacrolimus or permecrolimus do you recommend for your LPP patients? So again, I don't have protocols. Protocols and recipes are for cookbooks. And I don't think in terms of protocols at all. So I don't go into the back and pull out my LPP protocol and do this. This is how I treat. This is the formula for LPP. We take it on a patient-by-patient -patient level. Patients with diabetes are going to get different treatments than patients without diabetes. Patients with eye problems get different treatments and don't have eye problems. Patients that are thinking about pregnancy are getting different treatments than patients that are pregnant or may become pregnant. So every patient's different. And so tons of things get factored into the decision. And so each patient is taken on a case-by-case -case basis. But as far as the question about permecrolimus and tacrolimus, which are non-steroids, they're wonderful because they can be worked into a treatment plan and they don't thin the skin and they provide immunosuppression. So let's consider a patient on hydroxychloroquine, plaquenil, topical clobetazole, cetirizine, an antihistamine, and doxycycline. And the patient's doing really, really well. They just need a little bit more help. It's just a little bit active, a little bit red, a little bit of scale, but they're doing so well. That's just, you just need, they need a little bit more help. We might add tacrolimus once weekly or twice weekly. We don't need to do it twice a day. Tacrolimus, depending on how you get it, can be really gunky and, and greasy. But they need a little bit more help. Let's consider a situation where a patient is not doing well. 
and they need a lot more help. Well, we might possibly stop the doxycycline and switch to mycophenolate, mofetil, and more potent immunosuppressant. We might do tacrolimus four to five times a week. And we might start steroid injections as well. So it really depends on the situation. If a patient says, I'll tell you one thing, I'm not a pill person. I'll tell you one thing, I'm not taking any pills. I've decided. We'll, of course, review the fears that the patient has and why they have them, and I'll listen carefully to all the reasons. But if the patient is absolutely not going to use any of the immunosuppressing agents, then we might bring on tacrolimus daily, like you've said earlier. Or The problem is, is that in scarring alopecia management, the topical steroids are often more effective than the tacrolimus. The tacrolimus is helpful, but the steroids are more helpful. So we don't want to use the tacrolimus 12 times a day. So there's no room to put the clobetazole on because it's all gunked up in the hair because the clobetazole is more effective. So we want to balance the two. We don't want so much clobetazole used that the patient gets side effects from clobetazole absorption, you know, steroid withdrawal issues. So we might use clobetazole initially daily or twice a day, like I said. We might use tacrolimus once a day or you know, three times a week. So it really depends on how often a patient washes the hair. If a patient washes the hair daily, uh, you can get away with using tacrolimus every day. If a patient washes the hair once every two weeks, and that's all they're doing, because they always have washed their hair once every two weeks, and they're not changing, tacrolimus twice a day is not going to go over well, even if you make it up compounded in another formula formulation. Um, so all these things come into, into play when, when discussing this. So I don't believe in templates or formulas or recipes, but everything has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Do you recommend tacrolimus during steroid holidays? It's a wonderful option. If a patient is going to be taking a break from clobetazole, hit it hard with tacrolimus or permecrolimus. And nowadays we're using more and more topical tofacitinib or ruxolitinib. Question 44. Some dermatologists prescribe it seven days a week, twice a day. Your handout says two to six days. Is it not correct to think seven days a week is either not necessary, counterproductive, or results in more side effects? The tacrolimus and permecrolimus are not quite as good heavy hitters as some of the other options. They're useful, but they're not key, key options. And so, generally speaking, if you're using it seven days a week, it means something else isn't being used. And so, generally speaking, we're not using tacrolimus seven days a week because something else is going to be used on those other days that is quite effective. Nothing wrong with using it seven days a week, but usually tacrolimus is a kind of an add-on two, three, four days a week kind of thing. Sometimes for the frontal hairline, it can be more often. But generally, for further back, it's, uh, it's not daily. Your handout also lists joint pain as a possible side effect and says that joint pain is one of the symptoms and should cause a patient to stop and get medical advice. What would you recommend for a patient who's used tacrolimus before several times and each time it causes joint pain, particularly in the hands and feet? The patient was told by other physicians and the dermatologist it wasn't a side effect of tacrolimus, even though it kept happening when cycling back on the tacrolimus. So it's not a common side effect, but it can occur. The studies of tacrolimus ointment in the treatment of eczema showed that joint pains and arthralgias were more common in people using 
tacrolimus than people using the placebo or the fake. So it is possible. And I think if one gets joint pains when they're on it and they stop and the joint pains go away and they go back on and the joint pains come back and they go off it and joint pains go away, that this is adding to the, the evidence that it could be involved. Now, usually it's not a serious side effect, but any side effect needs to be discussed with one's physician. But if this is a side effect, it may not be the right medication for the patient. So be sure to review these very carefully with the physician. And finally, we'll move into the last set of questions. And I think these ones go a little bit quicker. I hope that you are enjoying this session and uh, I will move on. I am wondering if Dr. Donovan has any opinion on the use of sublingual minoxidil drops used in place of the tablets. I've been taking 1.25 milligram tablets for two months. My doctor recently prescribed the sublingual drops, which were made by a compounding pharmacy. She said that the drops have fewer side effects and are just as effective as the tablets. She said I may even be able to tolerate an increased dose. Haven't been able to find much information online. So, the sublingual oral minoxidil, in my opinion, is exciting. It may be associated with lower side effects, but it really needs more study, in my opinion. The concept of the sublingual is, is it gets taken into the body and not immediately converted or metabolized. So the bioavailability may be better. But when you actually look at the small studies that have been done of sublingual minoxidil, there's a hint that maybe side effects are less. But people still get dizzy, people still get hair on the face, and people still get swelling in the feet. So, and these are small studies. So I think that we need more studies. There's a group of people always with new treatments that you know, run with this and feel that this is the way to go. So online, etc., there will always be a group of people that are extremely excited about it. I think it's an interesting concept and I'm following it closely. When it comes to compounding products, uh, I always get a little, a little concerned because our do people compound it all the same way? So there's always a little bit of concern there. There are some people that are using the minoxidil and putting another, instead of taking the pill, they're putting it under their tongue and they're saying, I'm taking sublingual minoxidil. So there's a lot of variations about what constitutes sublingual, which only adds to the complexity of welcoming this treatment into our, into our world. So I'm certainly interested in sublingual oral minoxidil. I don't use it. I am looking forward to more and more information. The studies are so small that uh, there must be bigger studies on the way. So stay tuned for those. But um, people are still getting side effects. And so... Um, the promise here is that more bioavailability, less side effects. Um, not convinced yet, but excited. Sitting at the edge of my seat, waiting. So that's all I can say right now. I don't use sublingual oral minoxidil. I do not pick up the phone to call anybody to talk about sublingual oral minoxidil. Mostly because I'm battling so many side effects of low-dose oral minoxidil that I just don't have time to pick up the phone. But stay tuned. I think it's interesting and um, I'm interested. Question 47. At what point does one have an idea if Zeljans, tofacitinib, is working? If symptoms are quieter right after taking it, taking the drug, but it's more active on waking when it wears off, is that a good sign, one month in? In my opinion, that doesn't hit, uh, hit me one way or the other, influence me one way or the other, that symptoms are quieter right after taking it, and uh, 
wears off when when one wakes up. There's so many factors that go into that. If one, as soon as they wake up, the mind races and their life is just full speed ahead from 5.42 a.m. until 5.59 p.m. and then 5.59 p.m. they make a nice cup of tea and they relax and enjoy their evening and uh, that's when they take their tofacitinib. Then there's other factors that are, that are in here. So I'm not particularly uh, moved by this story that it's a necessarily a good sign. It's always nice when so things are quieter, so I'm glad things are quieter. But I don't think this is necessarily here or there as a sign that things are working. I think really the shedding, the redness, the itching, the burning are the factors that really will dictate if the, the medication is working. But one will know after uh, generally about three months, one will have a, a reasonably good idea if the drug's having a positive effect. Question 40 something. What are your thoughts on oral gabapentin? If Zyrtec is not working after a few years of burning symptoms. So when you think about scalp burning, there's two things to think about. One is the burning is coming from the active LPP. And if it's coming from the active LPP, then we need to treat the LPP more aggressively. We need to go down the treatment ladder to more and more aggressive treatments. But if the burning is coming from a dysesthesia, the nerves are just firing when they shouldn't be firing. They're just That's what we call a dysesthesia. Then we have a lot of treatment options to consider. And my thoughts when a patient has a dysesthesia is to first see if we can get lucky by minimal treatments, because sometimes we can what I mean by that is hypoallergenic shampoos, so getting rid of possible allergens and patch testing them if they haven't been patch tested, and considering simple things like apple cider vinegar rinses, where you fill up a spray bottle, one part apple cider vinegar and four parts water, and you spray it on your scalp when you're shampooing your scalp. And you use hypoallergenic shampoos and apple cider vinegar and see if it does anything. A certain proportion of patients works like magic. We didn't have to do it. You didn't have to use any medications. But then if, if the dysesthesia is still going and we're convinced it's a nerve issue, then we have to make a decision. Gabapentin, low-dose naltrexone. And there's no right or wrong answer. Gabapentin is more consistently effective, but low-dose naltrexone may have an important role as well. And they're fairly similar. But if one doesn't work, we'll go to the other. And it could be oral gabapentin, starting 100 milligrams at night, then 200, then 300 at night, and then 300 twice a day. Some patients do really quite well on 100 uh, at night. Some people need much more. But topical gabapentin is not out of the story, because some patients will do really well with a 6% topical gabapentin. Some patients don't like putting stuff in their scalp, especially, especially with a dysesthesia. Sometimes anything you do to the scalp is not good news for a dysesthesia. But gabapentin is on the list. And so the order that I think about, again, to reiterate, is hypoallergenic shampoos with apple cider vinegar, then a decision about gabapentin or low-dose naltrexone. And then more commonly, I'll move to an SSRI uh, like duloxetine, which has some uh, analgesic type properties and some uh, use in uh, neuropathies and uh, nerve related issues. And if that's not effective, I may consider amitriptyline, 10 milligrams nightly, sometimes 25. But that's how I think about the dysesthesias and the burning. When it comes to the burning I really want to make sure that I'm comfortable calling it a dysesthesia and it's not due to active LPP. And I really want to make sure that we've 
we've done the easy things like removed allergens and patch tested the patient. And sometimes some surprises come up that the patient's allergic to this preservative. And every time they shampoo, they're just, uh, you know, fueling the fire. And um, by removing those allergens, we, we really improve patient's quality of life. So that's my approach to burning, scalp burning. Thanks for the great, great question. But always consider patch testing. And the other point I wanted to make is always make sure seborrheic dermatitis is treated. Seborrheic dermatitis raises itself in most scarring alopecias. And uh, it's a cousin of dandruff. And it's as easy as treating with an anti-dandruff shampoo. And so you want to make sure that you've got an anti-dandruff shampoo on board. And generally, I'll use a hypoallergenic dandruff shampoo like a zinc zinc pyrithione-based hypoallergenic shampoo such as the Vanacream product, free and clear product. If the burn is really active, would you recommend a short period of cyclosporin to calm it if prednisone and topicals don't work? Is the cancer risk for consecutive use or does it start, does the clock start over when you're off it? It's probably consecutive. As far as the use of cyclosporin, certainly an option. It's a good option. I would certainly want patch testing to be done first because if there's an allergen in there, you figured it out really easily. And the anti-dandruff shampoos. And to give consideration to those steps, like uh, hypoallergenic shampoos, apple cider vinegar. But if you're convinced it's really an active scarring alopecia, and it's the LPP itself that's fueling this, the cyclosporin is not a, a bad option, but, you know, things like short courses of doxycycline, Things like hydroxychloroquine are still very much there on the list ahead of cyclosporin. And so I would still I would still proceed down that list fairly similarly in terms of the, the ladder for management. Question 50. If someone started to notice depigmentation on the scalp, does that mean the scarring is absolutely present? Not necessarily. Lots of reason for depigmentation. And um, it doesn't necessarily mean scarring, but it certainly is concerning for scarring. But be sure to show your dermatologist up close so they can examine. There's, there's other reasons sometimes for pigmentation changes. Question 51. Diagnosed with LPP in late 2019 using topical betamethasone three times a week and a shampoo with a corticosteroid one to two times a week. My scalp burns and is irritated recently. Wearing a hat outside really helps. Is this a reaction to long-term use of medications, or is it the LPP? So it's hard to say. Could be the LPP, could be unrelated. The things that we have to think about in the unrelated category is contact dermatitis. Is there an allergy here? Is this seborrheic dermatitis? Is there a fungus? Is there a tinea capitis? Is there some other autoimmune issue which is causing this burning and irritation? Is it medication related? Is there an alcohol in some of the topicals that are used that are are now irritating it? A new formulation of betamethasone or the corticosteroid? Sometimes topical corticosteroid shampoos really irritate people's scalps. Are you using a a new dandruff shampoo, which is really drying and irritating. So lots of reasons. Are you getting your hair colored and the new color is just not right for you? So lots of reasons that you could have this sort of irritation. So be sure to review this fully with your dermatologist. Hard to say exactly in this case. Question 52. Does red light therapy help LPP? I read a small article where it might. Uh, And that's right, there is a small trial where it might. So red light, the wavelength in red light, the 650, 652 nanometer wavelength, 
may have some benefits to reducing inflammation in LPP and in other inflammatory conditions. It's a minor contribution, but it is a contribution, and so I consider it as a, an add-on bonus. It may not be as effective as other mainstay treatments, but it certainly is an option for a patient with LPP that's fairly well controlled but needs something a little more to consider that. But yeah, it may help some people. Question 53. I would like to know if there are any topical JAK inhibitors that work for FFA. So I like this question because when someone says to me, does it work? Sometimes the answer is easy because when someone says, does a topical JAK inhibitor work for FFA? My feeling is yes. But remember, there's a whole range from work to from it works a little bit to it works incredible. And that's a big spectrum. So I think that we need good studies to prove that the topical JAK inhibitors work, but I certainly do feel in my patients that uh, topical JAK inhibitors work, topical tofacitinib, especially because we've had more years of experience with it, but topical ruxolitinib is an option as well. But I'm not convinced that they, they work above and beyond other treatments. So they're not superseding other treatments. And, you know, there were studies in um, last year which suggested that the JAK pathway is so important in FFA. And so with studies like that, you'd think that, wow, these topical JAK inhibitors must be, must be the answer to FFA. They don't seem to be that degree of effectiveness, but they do something positive. And so I think they're more towards the left side of works a little bit. But in some patients, they work somewhat. But they're not over to the right side. It works incredible. But um, we need better studies about the, the JAKs, and I think those are coming in FFA. And uh, is there any way we can do more to the JAKs to make them more effective? We don't use topical... Baricitinib, we don't use topical abrocitinib, upadnacitinib. The main topicals are ruxolitinib and uh, tofacitinib at the present time. Ruxolitinib opsalura is a 1.5% cream, and tofacitinib is a cream that, or lotion that you compound at a pharmacy anywhere from 2 to, to 3.5%. So, I think, if memory serves, yes. So, that brings us to the end of the fourth movement of webinar, <laughs> Scarring Alopecia. I want to thank everyone for sticking with me to the end. It's really been uh, my pleasure to, to join you on this Scarring Alopecia Awareness Month and to speak about this important topic, this has just been an incredible uh, submission of questions. And so thank you for sending them in. Uh, they're fantastic questions, and I hope this was helpful for you. And uh, we'll be sure to do this again. Um, scarring alopecia is certainly changing a lot, and we're, we're getting better at treating it. We're getting better at diagnosing it. More and more physicians and non-physicians worldwide are uh, familiar with, with these issues now. We're, we're picking up scarring alopecias at earlier and earlier stages now, and we're comfortable being more aggressive in, in the management of scarring alopecias, which ultimately leads to better outcomes for patients. And I think patients are, are becoming advocates for um, their health, and uh, I really, truly believe that's wonderful. There are um, important organizations like the Scarring Alopecia Foundation, which is really raising awareness for scarring alopecia worldwide, and I'm grateful to be part of that organization. And um, there are other online resources and support groups through Facebook, that are really playing an important role in um, uh, sharing of information and supporting each other in conditions that are 
somewhat uncommon, but collectively, when you add up the percentages across the world, we have a lot of people with scarring alopecia. And so these support groups really play a really important role. And as we say goodbye to the month of September and we think about these groups like the Scarring Alopecia Foundation, um, if you do feel so moved to um, consider them in your in your donation plans, it really goes a long way. Uh, this particular group really um, has big plans to, to make the lives of people with scarring alopecia all that better and promote research. And so it's really uh, an honor to be part of their, their organization as well. Thanks so much for joining me for this webinar. I hope as I click stop that this will convert as it should. And we will post this to the Donovan Medical YouTube channel for you to review at some point later. But I say goodbye, good night, good morning, wherever you are. Thanks so much for joining me. We'll see you again. Bye for now.